Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're gonna be looking at increasing sales through creative packaging as this Marijuana Venture article talks about experts that estimates there's more than 28,000 cannabis brands in the US alone with more on the way. And the problem is how to stand out in a herd of cannabis capitalists, especially if you don't have the budget for a huge ad campaign. So one solution is an innovative eye-catching design So a product's packaging is your brand's most consistent form of advertising. So how exactly does cannabis packaging design lead to increased product sales? Well, on the line with us is Jason Lammers of 420 Wholesale Pack to help us unpack that question. Jason, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks for having me again, Josh. So the uh, Marijuana Venture jumps into this one question about a product's packaging is your most consistent brand of advertising. So how exactly does cannabis packaging lead to increased product sales? From your experience, how exactly does that uh, lead from just packaging to sales? Uh, Well, one really unique uh, aspect we have, I think, in our industry compared to a lot of others is uh, the sustainability component, whereas it's definitely getting a lot more uh, kind of media play these days in general. Uh, the cannabis industry really from the jump has always been pretty passionate about that uh, in this space. And so sustainable, sustainability and sustainable packaging really are marketing plays in this industry because uh, not only is it the right thing to do, it's really what the consumers ultimately want. So it's really something you can leverage for your brand to uh, not only do the right thing, but also uh, you know, help out the planet while you're uh, getting your packaging done. So you're going to be going down to MJ BizCon in Vegas, the largest you know, industry event. And last year when I interviewed you on the floor, we were talking about waste. And one of the things is with labeling specifically, if you're going to order labels from China and having regulatory risk, a lot of that uh, labels were obsolete in route to the U.S. Are you seeing uh, people printing in the U.S. as kind of a way to reduce that risk? Or are you seeing still you know, wasted money in, in labeling? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of really good in-house solutions now in the market uh, that can really uh, not only reduce waste, uh, save costs, but also kind of give you that flexibility and that on-demand branding capabilities. Um, Traditionally, in in most markets in the old days, you pretty much were stuck buying labels pre-printed from a label printer. And you, you know, if you did, did it domestically, you're probably waiting anywhere from one to four weeks to get that done. If you're going international, it might be one to two months. And so you've got a lot of lead time there. And then generally speaking, you're almost always buying more than you really want to, uh, to get the price point that you want. And so you might need to have that nickel per label price. And so ultimately you might have to buy 50,000 labels to get that price point. Uh, what ultimately ends up happening is, especially in this industry with regulations and just constant changes in the marketplace, you ultimately end up throwing a lot of your labels away with that business model. And so with in-house printers, you can kind of eliminate a lot of those factors. You can get things printed up on demand out to market in the same day and, and eliminate that label waste uh, that you're ultimately were throwing away in the past. And then you, and then you also just have that speed to market because you're, you're making your labels in-house and then getting it done quickly. Yeah, it's all about getting that done quickly. You know what is also fast is the amount of time that consumers look. You spend all this time and money on packaging, branding, everything else. You know, on average, according to the article, customers only give it seven seconds. So studies show that the average consumer looks at a product on a shelf for about seven seconds before making a purchasing decision. You have seven seconds for your package to tell them everything you need to know, what the product is, what they should do, how they should buy it how it should make them feel. And so off the air, we were kind of talking about millennials and how Tom's shoes is a perfect example of how a customer could buy a shoe, but they're choosing to buy Tom's shoes because they're trying to help people. They donate, you know, shoes and they're uh, socially conscious. And um, I think a lot of investors and millennials in general are going to kind of gravitate towards that, um, having an emotional connection. So people buy products because of what products say about them personally. Are you seeing that in the cannabis space? Oh, definitely. I think, uh, you know, and we kind of alluded to that earlier that I think the cannabis space is a little bit unique and that it seems to be kind of ahead of its time and the, uh, than a lot of other industries. And so there's absolutely an opportunity to, uh, to ultimately do the right thing and, uh, and kind of have, have a socially conscious brand uh, out there that ultimately is gonna, you know, uh, separate yourself from a lot of the other people in the industry. Socially conscious or what the Harvard Business Review is calling psychological ownership. So consumers understand perhaps intuitively or subconsciously that the product they send a message to others and even to themselves about the kind of person they are, the circles they run in, their ability to make choices. So in other words, people see brands as an extension of themselves. 
So your job as a product manufacturer is to package your product in a way that embodies the target customer's lifestyle, their values, their interests, the problems they need to solve, and the perceptions that they want others to see. So for cannabis companies, there's an additional challenge. Different people come to cannabis for different reasons. So medicinal cannabis customers might think more about the functional benefits, whereas a recreational cannabis consumer might be drawn to brand's lifestyle image. Ultimately, it's all about the emotional connections. And so that's kind of what I wanted to bring in with a new product that you have about um, recycling dude tubes specifically. That's probably one of the, the biggest products sold in stores is pre-rolls and therefore a lot of waste. And we've seen uh, pre-roll waste in Asia and Europe and Mexico, all over every rec state, medical state. And you've got a very interesting product to help reduce that as well as draw in an emotional connection to a US based product that's 3D printed from recyclable materials. Tell me a little bit more about this 3D printed dude tube from recycled material. Yeah, so actually, uh, so it is actually an injection molded product. What we have right now currently is 3D printed prototypes uh, that we've kind of been showing uh, the industry. Um, essentially, we're copying one of the most popular designs. So the form function is, is not really changing. We really wanted to maintain that consistency because so many brands have kind of adopted their packaging to kind of already fit that style. And so we're basically taking the mo most popular design style out of China, uh, making a, a big mold here in the U.S. We're going to manufacture right here in Washington State. Uh, they're going to be cost competitive to the Chinese product and we're sourcing 100% uh, recycled polypropylene uh, to make all of our materials. So we won't actually be adding any new bird and plastic into the waste stream whatsoever. We'll be collecting stuff that's already out there in the marketplace, uh, cleaning it, grinding it, and then turning it into new pre-roll packaging at a cost competitive uh, price. So tying that into branding, the goal in any industry is to create a clear, unique, compelling brand identity. Uh, and so trying to grab something that's you know, socially, environmentally conscious, um, how do you get other companies to get on board with that? Obviously, it's going to be cheaper than buying it from overseas in China and it's made in the U.S. and uh, it's from recycled material, right? So does that speak for itself? Do you anticipate that sales are going to just happen automatically? Are you going to have to advertise a lot to get people to understand your, your vision, your mission? Uh, well, so far we have been uh, talking about this product a little bit at a few of the trade shows we've been at. Obviously, we're going to really be, do the big announcement at MJ BizCon in a couple of weeks. But so far, the feedback has been phenomenal. Um, I think ultimately, if you can give the customers, uh, you know, a more sustainable product at a at a comparable price point, it's a pretty easy sell at that point, right? Uh, we're not really asking them to rebrand their product lines. We're simply identifying something that a lot of people in the marketplace need for packaging and figuring out a way to do it better. So uh, it's really been so far. The response has been excellent and it's been a pretty easy uh, you know, sales point because we're, we're ultimately providing a better product that's already out there in the marketplace. So do you anticipate having any other materials or packaging? I know that concentrates are probably the second highest product sold behind dube tubes. So is this just the beginning for, I know that you're on the board for the Cannabis Alliance, the lobbying group here based in Seattle, and you're on the the packaging committee. You're the chair of that. And you've uh, reduced the the mylar thickness requirements in the state, reducing waste. And so I, I know that you've got some crystal ball predictions on, on waste and recycling and packaging. Well, what's going to be happening in the future? Well, I think, uh, you know, as far as from our company standpoint, uh, the, the, the taking that same concept of developing uh, injection molded products that are made in the U S uh, that are already being used in the marketplace that are imported out of China is, is a big focus for us going forward. And so we'll definitely be looking at other, other items that we can essentially replicate, make them locally, make them better, make them from recycled materials, uh, you know, in a cost competitive fashion. So I think we'll be rolling out quite a few things in regards to that. Uh, and then as far as our work at the Alliance, you know, I think some of the, the next big, uh, task, I think ultimately for us is going to be tackling the plant waste issues. You know, packaging waste certainly gets talked about a lot, but uh, plant waste is another big problem in our space. And so uh, I think we're going to be really focusing on that uh, in 2020. And hopefully we'll be getting our plant waste issues uh, addressed properly. Uh, and then obviously there's still lots of work to do in the packaging space. Um, so, you know, ultimately the end game, I think, is to have a completely, you know, sustainable packaging ecosystem. And we're quite a far way away from that. So uh, we'll just continue to keep working uh, on all of those projects as well going forward. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I know that I've been trying to get recycled dirt uh, for a long time and uh, the state will not let you go and collect dirt and try to recycle that. And uh, it's been an issue. So hopefully we'll have some movement in 2020. We'll see.
see what happens. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. By the way, if you enjoy the content, please show your support with the cushy gesture of $4.20 a month on the Talking Hedge's Patreon page. This will kind of help you spread the word. I've been asked to speak all over the world uh, from Toronto and Colombia, Spain, um, Miami, all over Tokyo. But your support's important to me. I haven't monetized the podcast. I want to be as authentic and transparent as possible. I want to avoid conflicts of interest uh, or even the perception of paid opinions. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or pay me on the Talking Hedges Patreon page or don't and I'm out.